what's up. Put your hands together a little bit. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I out this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching from social media. If you're here this morning and you're visiting with us, there's little yellow cards on the back of these pews. Would you find one? Fill that little information out. Miss Janet's at the welcome table. As you start out, go over there by and see her. Give that to her and she'll have something for you. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, guys, Edgar's out sick this morning, but we're going to have a uh, youth swimming party at the house Friday night. I've got hamburgers and hot dogs and, and uh, so we come here to the church and we'll carpool you up there. We don't have enough parking spaces for everybody to drive their own car, but Edgar's gonna be here. If he gets well, we'll be here to grab you. If not, I'll be here. We'll grab you and take you up to the house and we'll do that starting at six o'clock Friday afternoon. Uh, our church-wide Thanksgiving, man, this year's gone by, hasn't it? 
Yes. Our, our Thanksgiving meal is just around the corner, November the 12th, and many of you are already asking. Uh, listen, you know, I think Johnny does a turkey or two. Uh, I do a turkey. I know Hank and Jen do some barbecue. Uh, Mr. Clark's pretty good about bringing a ham, so we'll have plenty of meat. We always have that. So if you're going to stay, we encourage you to stay with us, celebrate uh, just a time of fellowship. Uh, help us with that. Bring a covered dish, okay? Um, sweet potatoes, chocolate pudding, um, <laughs> all of that good stuff. Gravy, you know, any of that kind of stuff that you like to go with that. But come and stay with us and, and celebrate with us, and we appreciate all that you do. Yeah. Well, because we had we had one year where we everybody brought gravy and nobody brought stuffing. We had another year where everybody brought stuffing to make up for it, and then nobody brought gravy. So there will be a sign-up sheet, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll right? get a sign-up. So we'll all know what's, who's bringing what. I'm just what. announcing it because I've already had people ask me, hey, are we going to bring food? Because at all of our uh, days of revival, Mike has catered those for us, and he does a fantastic job. But this is one of those situations that, you know, we, we'll come, you bring your dish and come, and we'll have that Thanksgiving meal uh, with us. Again, there's so many things going on here at the church, and things that we help with. Uh, if you were here Wednesday night, I'm not going to show it this morning, but you know we took up a love offering for Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, sent it over there. Uh, Mark and Carla, who used to be members here, that's where they go to church at. Carla filmed uh, Mark. He got the check. He presented it to the church, uh, Pastor Bob Hazel. And so we showed a little video Wednesday night of them doing that. They're so thankful for the money that we took up. Uh, so we try to help. We, we do the best we can do. And, and uh, so if you would like to help us in what we're doing here at Inglewood Baptist Church, of course, we'll take up an offering here in a little bit. There's envelopes in the back of the pew. You can give that way. If you're watching from social media, you have two ways. You can go to our webpage. We have an online giving out there. You can give that way. Or you can just mail it to us at Inglewood Baptist Church, P.O. Box 10959, Jacksonville, Florida, 32247. Jennifer? Yep, just a couple of things I have. Um, we won't be doing um, cross training today, but those kids are welcome to come back to my class. Uh, Johnny's not here today, and if you wanna know why, you can come back and ask me. And you know, when you come back and help, if you're curious, then I'll tell you then. But if you don't come back and help, I'm not gonna tell you. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'll still tell you. Um, so, but we are having um, children's church, so everybody can come back there. Um, we will be doing a Seriously in Love with Jesus, a serial Sunday, um, on Time Change Sunday, November 5th. I'm thinking it's probably gonna be about 9.30. Um, we gain an hour, so there's no excuse. Y'all can all come, uh, come back, have some cereal, some fruit. Um, I would do Pop-Tarts again, but last time I did Pop-Tarts and supplemented with cereal, and everybody just ate cereal, and I had Pop-Tarts left over. So we're just gonna do cereal this time. Um, don't forget about Operation Christmas Child. You can build a box online, super easy. Um, you can just go to that website. It's, it's a site for our church. Um, you can also share it on your Facebook. There's a QR code um, and just share it on your Facebook and maybe we can get some other folks involved from, from outside of our church. Um, and don't forget about Awana every Wednesday night. Um, we're still doing Awanas um, and we still need some folks to help out with the younger set. Um, they're super fun, so uh, sign up to help with those guys. Thank you, Jennifer. Laverne and his class is not in here today because we're trying a new thing. Um, he's going to be teaching a class back there. He's going to be preaching to them. I think they're going to have their own uh, music. But they have nine back there today. Praise and God. so, uh, you know, we're trying to get that uh, Hispanic ministry up and running. And there's so many dynamics to that. I never dreamed how many dynamics it was to that. Part of the problem is Laverne says, I, I can't translate Alabamian. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're trying some different things. So they're, they're here. You'll get to see them as we dismiss, but they're back there uh, having their own class this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day and the many blessings of life. We yes. just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for those that are watching from social media, Father, we ask your blessings upon each and every one. We do pray for the peace of Jerusalem today, Amen. Father. We pray that you'll protect them as uh, you've said in your word that you will. Yes. And Father, just help us in America to understand what's going on. Yes. Let us know that the enemy is, is trying, Father. His days are numbered. Amen. And as we get closer to that time, Father, things will grow worse and worse. Your word tells us that. Yes. But let us not grow weary in well-doing. For we know, Father, that in the end we'll reap 
and we'll hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Yes. We thank you. We lead, uh, ask you to lead God and direct us now as we go through this service. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Stand and sing with us. All hail the power in Jesus' name.
in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that with you on our side, everything is possible. Lord, we have so many people out that are sick with surgeries, with, we don't even know all the people. There's so many out sick all over the world. There's fighting going on. You've told us this was going to happen. We're watching, you know, just like the news, we watch the Bible because it tells us the story of what's going to happen. Lord, we, we pray every day that you watch over us and keep us safe. And Lord, you know, we bless these tithes and offerings that we're going to take for your house so we can come and praise you, Lord. Our praise team for the music that they present to us that opens our heart to you, Lord. And the message that the pastor brings to us. Lord, we praise all of that. We praise all this in your name. Amen.
in us. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing with us, church. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. Make your way to the back for Children's Church. Give us a tie. Here again, you can always help with Children's Church or the nursery. Uh, there's quite a few that go back there, and we can always use your help. I want to ask you to take your Bible and open up with me. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. We're going to look at verse 8 to get us into our message. You know, the last song, Hank and I, and I've said this many times, I'm always amazed at how the Holy Spirit leads. And I shouldn't be, but I, I am, because Hank and I don't sit down and, and I say, well, my sermon title is going to be this, or I'm going to use this scripture. 
But the last, all, all the songs uh, match my sermon, but how deep the Father's love for us is going to go right along with my message. And, I, and I'm praying when you're watching from social media, when you watch this, or if you're looking, you're here today. The title of our message is Seven Things God Cannot Think Of. Seven Things God Cannot Think Of. And look at verse 8 with me. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day and the many blessings of life. Once again, Father, we pray your blessings upon your word as we read it, as we preach it today, Father. Hide us behind the cross and let us preach Jesus and him crucified. Father, if there's someone here today that needs to make a decision, if they're watching today, Father, and they do not know Jesus Christ and the free pardon and forgiveness of sin, that today will be the day of salvation. We ask your blessings upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's the story that uh, Billy Graham was in a large city getting ready to do uh, a crusade. And he was downtown, he was lost, he couldn't find the Colosseum, and, and so he stops this little boy on the street, and he says, son, he said, can you help me find the Colosseum? He said, I'm going to be speaking there tonight. And he said, if you'll help me find it, he said, if you'll come, then I'll tell you all the things God knows. And the little boy says, well, tell me something God doesn't know, and the Colosseum's just around the block. There's a play on words here. God knows everything, right? So when we say that, you know, it might be easier, and that's what we're going to do here. There's a play on words. Seven things God cannot think of. So the first thing that I thought about, and, and I tried to find who. I, I, I was at the men's state night. Brother Larry preached this message by this title. I looked online, and there's several titles, by the same title, several messages. A dear friend of mine back home, by a pastor friend of mine, his name is Nelson Bullard. He used to come into the pastor's meeting every Monday, and we'd meet over in a little associational building, and our director of missions would have on a pot of coffee, and pastors would come in on Monday morning, and we'd just talk about things that were going on at the church, things that other pastors would know and understand, and you know, pray for one another. And Brother Nelson would come in with his notes, he always had his notes typed, and he would come in, and he would hand them out to all the pastors, and he would say, boys, I preached this yesterday in my church, and it went well. Take it and let it run through your cup. Make it yours, because there's not an original sermon. So I, I want to give God credit for this. Brother Larry, I heard him preach this, but the thoughts and things that are going to be here apply to us at Englewood Baptist Church and to most Christians today. So the first thing that God cannot think of is a sin he does not hate. God cannot think of a sin that he does not hate. God hates sin because it goes against his very nature. And sin is the work of the devil. God hates that. And listen, folks, I don't care what we call it today. We can pretty it up. We can put you know, all kinds of uh, names on it, but sin is still sin, amen? And, and we get to where we want to categorize it. Well, this sin's worse than that sin. No, it's not. God hates all sin. Yes. And so you and I as Christians need to understand that, and there's not a sin that God doesn't hate. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, Ye of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Listen, folks, when we look at the world today and the things that are going on, listen, when I look at the world, it doesn't surprise me that they act that way because they're doing exactly what their father, the devil, wants them to do. And listen, you know, we're, there's two kinds of people in this world, amen? They're saved and unsaved. Now, even with the saved, there's two kinds of people. There's carnal and there's spiritual. <laughs> so we can get into that. But listen, we need to hate sin as much as God hates sin. 
And when we do that, we'll see the church of Jesus Christ fill up. Because there's so many things in the world today that stand between church, salvation, God, the world. So many Christians are trying to hold on to the, the world and they're straddling the fence and there, there's a struggle that's going on trying to figure out which way to go. And let me tell you something. As we said last Sunday in our message, you'll never have peace until you give your whole heart to Jesus Christ. The Word of God describes sin as a wound or a bruise in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6. I didn't ask Barbara to put these up, but I'm going to call out some scriptures. You can write it down. It describes it as a burden in Psalms 38, 4. It describes it as a, a weight in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. There's a weight that so easily besets us, it says. That sin that trips us up, that thing that gets us down. Listen, folks, I don't know about you, but I've been burdened lately, and even some of you have come to me and said, Pastor, what's going on? You know, I can just look in your eyes and tell something's going on. I just got to be honest with you. I'm burdened for the church today. I'm burdened for people that I know and that I love, and they're just living like there's no tomorrow. But, folks, I'm telling you, there's a judgment day coming one day. Amen. And you say, well, you're just an old man. You know, you're just, you're just an old guy that's that's, you know, saw his sunset, and you're right, I've got more days behind me than i got ahead of me. But folks, I don't want to go to heaven alone. I want you to go with me. And the Bible says that sin is a weight, it's a burden. And I feel that burden so many times of people that I love and that I know, and I just wish they would straighten up. I just wish they would give their life to the Lord because there's nothing that I have to do, there's nothing that you have to do other than except Jesus Christ. The Bible says that it's a debt in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 and 15. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible describes sin as a stain. And then in that verse, the Lord gives a great invitation. He says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be white as wool. People, I'm begging with you today. I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm watching the camera. And, and I know there's people out there that need to make a decision. There's people that have gotten away from church. And they're not as close to the Lord as they used to be. Folks, he's right where you left. He left you. You left him. He's right there with arms open wide. There's not a sin that God does not hate. And until we realize that. And listen, folks, I'm not telling you that once you accept Jesus Christ, you're going to be perfect because we're not. But what I can tell you is the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father and He's sitting at the right hand of, of God the Father and He's making intercessions for you and I. And when I mess up and when I stumble and when I fall and it's all the time, all I have to do is stand up and say, Father, forgive me. Amen. Help me to do better. Help me to put one... He, we sang a song that talked about the same power. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that lives in you and I today. And sometimes I know this life doesn't get easy. The, it's not. But you know what? It's that power that's within us that helps us to not grow weary in well-doing. It's that power that's within us that helps us put one foot in front of the other because people are watching. Do I believe what he says? I was listening to... Uh, I shared with you on Wednesday night. I'm listening to a guy named Chad Bird. He talks about seeing the Bible through Hebrew eyes and he goes into the language and, and, he's, and, and I just enjoy listening to it because he's so smart about things that I'm not smart about. But he was talking about the tomb and the tomb is empty. And he said, I know. He said, I lost my 20-year-old son. He was 21-year-old. He was in the Navy. He had an accident, lost his son. And he said, I went through a dark time. And he said, uh, folks, there's, there's so many things that happen to us in life. But he said, I want you to know that that tomb was empty. There was a work that took place through Jesus Christ in that tomb. And on the third day, he was, he was risen. And folks, we might go into that tomb. We might go into that grave. But if we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe his word to be true, and I do, then there's going to be a resurrection day one day. Amen. We won't stay there. There's not a sin that God doesn't hate. Number two, God cannot think of a sinner he does not love. God cannot think of a sinner he does not love. 
In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, God loves the unlovable. You and I were there. Sometimes we still are. You know, I've been struggling this week and in the last couple of weeks and just God's dealing with me and I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, He's just dealing with me. and I can feel that weight. Like I said, there's a burden on me. And Tammy got up one morning and she says, I don't know what's got under your saddle, but you better figure it out. <laughs> you better figure out what that burr is. Well, when the Lord's dealing with you and you just have to get alone sometimes and you have to, you like, whatever you got to do. But folks, there's not a sinner that God cannot think of a sinner He does not love. We were unlovable. We still are. But Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God commended His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That unconditional love. We don't get to see that a lot. You, it was a couple, a couple steak nights ago. I was there... Some of the guys were with me, and I don't know if they remember it or not, but sitting at our table, there was a grandfather who had his teenage grandson, and his grandson had Down syndrome. And they were sitting at the table with us. Before we, before we knew they were sitting there, they came in late. We went down, started down to get our food, and I was walking, and I felt somebody grab my hand. And, and I turned, I thought, well, it was somebody that, you know, wanted to speak to me. Somebody had saw me or whatever. And when I turned, it was this little five-foot, 16-year-old Down syndrome teenage boy had grabbed my hand. And when I turned to look at him, he gave me a big old bear hug. Unconditional love. His grandfather came up and he said, sir, I'm sorry. He's just very affectionate. I looked at his grandfather. I said, that's okay. I needed a hug. I needed a hug. That's unconditional love, folks. So simple. Jesus says, suffer not the little children to come unto me. I wish we could be that simple. The world causes us to be cynical and we look at things and we don't see things like we ought to see through God's love. God cannot think of a sinner he does not love. Listen, I don't know what you're going through or what you've been through or what you're even facing. But God loves you just the way you are. You don't have to do anything. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. All you have to do is by faith believe in Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. He loves you too much to leave you that way. He's not going to let you stay in sin. He's not going to let you keep in the life that you're living but He loves you too much to leave you that way. God cannot think of a sinner that He does not love. Number three, God cannot think of a greater way to heaven than Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Folks, there's no other way to heaven. I know the world's out there, they're telling us, oh, we're just narrow-minded. You better believe I'm narrow-minded. The Bible says there's one way, and it's Jesus Christ, and there's no other way, folks. I don't care. You can go to all the other tombs. You can go where all these other leaders and isms and cult leaders have been, and there's still bones in that grave. But when you go to the grave of Jesus Christ, it's empty. It's empty. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Jesus Christ is the only way. He's not one of the ways. He's the only way. And God cannot think of a greater way to heaven than by His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, There's no other way to the Father but by me. Number four. God could not think of a more pleasing sacrifice than Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, we can do all we want. People think they... We've read stories in the Bible where people thought they could buy their salvation. People think they can work for their salvation. There is nothing you and I can do that would take the place of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
We can live our best life. We can, we, can, we can try all the things that we want to try. We can have all the education that we want to have. You can give all the money that you want to give and you can give it to BR549 because it's still not going to help. Right. But there's not a greater sacrifice than Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall uh, prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Amen. There's no greater sacrifice than Jesus Christ. There's no more pleasing sacrifice to God the Father than his Son, Jesus Christ. Right. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it said, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. There's no greater sacrifice, there's no more pleasing sacrifice to God the Father than Jesus Christ. Listen, it, the Bible said here in these verses, God the Father is pleased that in Jesus Christ, his beloved Son, all fullness shall dwell. Everything was given to Jesus. Everything in the end will be put at His feet. All the fullness will come. And it's pleased that all the works that died on the cross through His blood, all the things, we don't have to have the sacrifices. We don't have to have our work. Why? Because Jesus on the cross said it was finished. And He reconciled everything to Himself. Jesus is our sacrifice. God cannot think of a more pleasing sacrifice than His only begotten Son. Yes. Number five, God cannot think of a more prepared place than heaven for His saints. And Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. You know, I, I just wish my vocabulary was better. I wish I could describe it to you. You know, we played the video at times of our uh, as, uh, brother Lockridge. He was a pastor of days gone by, and, and they had asked him at a, a conference that he was at. He was the stately gentleman that was there of all these pastors, and they asked him to stand up, and, and he stood up, and in this video, somebody had put it together and put some music and a video behind it, and he says, I wish I could describe it to you. I wish I could describe my Jesus to you. Let me tell you, he's my buckler, he's my shield. I can't tell you all the words that we can come and all the vocabulary, all the adjectives and the verbs and the nouns. There's just not enough to describe Jesus Christ. Amen? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, or I have, uh, I have seen or ear or heard, that have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. God cannot think of a more prepared place than heaven. Folks, I don't know about you, but my, my name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. It's been sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And folks, I believe with all my heart it's getting close to trumpet time. Amen. I believe that. That eastern sky is going to go bust wide open one day. We're going to hear the trumpet. Are you ready? Are you ready? Can you imagine... Here, listen, not a better place prepared for those that love Him. Heaven. There's a place that the Bible says that has streets of gold. There's a place that the Bible says the gates are walls of jasper and the gates are made of rubies and all kinds of precious gems. There's going to be mansions there. Most of all, the Bible says it'll be a place where there's no more sorrow. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more labors. There'll be no more, no more pain. Folks, can you imagine that? God says there's not a better place or a more prepared place than heaven for his saints. Number six, God cannot think of a place more horrible than hell. God cannot think of a place more horrible than hell. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, I put this up in the English Standard Version. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. God created hell for Satan. 
and all his demons. Yes. But for all those who, re who reject Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us they'll spend eternity there. People ask me all the time, you talk about a loving God, and he is. You talk about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ, and we just read John 3, 16. Tell me that God doesn't love the world. He says he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And all you and I have to do is give of ourselves. We have to give our heart. That's all we have to do. And God loves us. But I'm, he says, well, you know, all these people are dying and going to hell. That's their choice. God's giving you a way out. And it's through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 13, verse 28, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Listen, just because your name's on the church roll, just because you're sitting here this morning and you tithe and you've been baptized, doesn't mean that you're going to heaven, folks. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the most important thing. Matthew chapter 7, 22 and 23 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your, in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I, have, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. People, let me share with you. Let me beg you. Go out. I want you to make it your mission this week to invite one person to church. One person. If you're not willing to stand there and ask the tough questions, here's what you need to say. You don't say, hey, are you a church member? That's the wrong question. The wrong question. The, the, the next question should be, or the first question should be, do you know Jesus Christ? Amen. Do you know Jesus Christ? Amen. If you don't, let me tell you about Him. And then let me invite you to our church. Let me invite you to come in here. I was sharing with our class on Wednesday night you know, some of these churches, they have daycares and they have schools and they have nurseries that they work during the week and it helps bring in money and you have to have the workers and you pay the workers. And, and I asked a pastor that has a daycare and a school and I said, does that enhance your congregation on Sunday morning? And he said, sadly, no. Sadly, no, it does not. He said, our congregation is not very big. And that's very surprising to me, uh, to the size of the campus that they had. And here's what I thought, and here's what I said. You know what I would do? I would go to that school. I would go into a public announcement when they're all in the gym together, and all the parents and everybody's there for an orientation or whatever. And I would say, listen, if you have a child that's coming to our daycare, you have a child that's in our school or in our nursery, and you're paying for that, here's what I want to do. If you'll join our church and you'll come for a year, I'll give you a 10% discount on that. People are like, wow. You know, because listen, I have people all the time call the church and say, we'd like to use your sanctuary for a wedding. Our bylaws, which were written way before I got here, say you have to be a member to use the auditorium for a wedding or for a funeral. Okay, and then you know what the next question is? What do I have to do to be a member? Well, it's not a country club, folks. But yet, here's what God's Word says. It says, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Yes. Let me tell you something. Some people, 10% would compel them to come in. Now, here's my thinking behind this. God says, if you preach the Word and the Word is preached, if you proclaim the Word, it will not return unto me void. So here, if you join our church for a year to get that 10%, after that year, we'll give you the 10%. But being a member, you have to be here three out of four Sundays. Now, here's what's happened. They're sitting under the Word of God. They're sitting under the Word of God. When they get under the Word, the Holy Spirit will do His job. Amen? He will convict them. He will put them in their place. He will tell them about their sin. And when they're under true preaching of the Bible, they will join that church and they won't even think about that 10%. Amen. Compel them to come in. 
to my house. God cannot think of a better time to be saved. Number seven. God cannot think of a better time to be saved than right now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. As Brother Hank comes, we're going to have our hymn of invitation. As the choir gets ready, our, our praise team gets ready. God cannot think of a better time to be saved than right now. What did he say? We read it in Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. If your heart's been stirred today and you're sitting here in this congregation, when we have this altar call, don't wait. You don't have to wait till they start the music. You don't have to wait. You can come now. I'll have one of the deacons come up here and pray with you until I can get done. I'll come down here and pray with you. You don't have to wait till the song's over. You don't have to wait till they sing the first verse. You come now. Because when the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, folks, you better make a move right then. Don't put it off and say, I can wait till tomorrow because the cemetery is full of people who put things off to tomorrow and it didn't get done. But God cannot think of a better time to be saved than now. God bless you and we love you. Make a move before it's everlasting too late. Thank you for watching from social media. Brother Hank, you lead us as we sing.